Okay, are we ready? All right, Anami Keg, Anami Keg, Bina. Welcome, welcome back. All right, I hope everybody had a good uh, and safe holidays. Uh, unfortunate, some of us were sick, Akuji, but uh, I guess we survived it. So, yeah. So uh, I have an interesting story tonight. This one is on a scroll, Birch Park scroll. You can see, hopefully the viewers uh, can see. I wanna say welcome wherever you are. Say welcome to my granddaughter who's viewing. So uh, this story is entitled Mo Wiss. This is a story of love, but it's also a story of magic, but it's also, also, and it's a story of uh, how far some people will go in jour the journey for love. Uh, but uh, this story also will teach us that sometimes uh, we go too far. And uh, and sometimes uh, things don't work out, and uh, we get uh, envious, envious of uh, others who find love or find kindness or love, and some people get lost in that too. Well, <clears throat> the story starts. In this one village, long time ago, uh, these parents announced that their daughter uh, was ready to get married. And of course, uh, girls back then, young women back then, they just couldn't do anything they wanted. Uh, there was all kinds of rules and taboos and stuff amongst the people about relationships and uh, and relationships were meant to uh, be firm and last a long time. You know, the rules were followed. Well, this particular young lady, a lot of the young men had been waiting for a long time for this to happen. And the reason why is she was the most beautiful woman, woman in, the camp, in the village, in the camp. In fact, uh, the word got around and seems like overnight in a few days, there was all kinds of young men coming to the village. They wanted to ask for this young woman's hand in marriage. Well, these, uh, this young woman, she was, uh, she was a little bit different, you know? I mean, externally, she was a really, really beautiful young woman. Uh, but she kind of also knew it, you know, she kind of also knew it, you know, and so she had a group of girlfriends, so to speak, that were kind of her group and wherever she went, she, uh, all these young girls or ladies would follow her. They were envious of her beauty and all her popularity and stuff. And so. Well, in the same village, there was these two brothers. They were, uh, they weren't really brothers, but just like good friends, grew up like brothers, everything they did together. So they thought, well, finally the day came, you know. And so uh, they were tearing through their personal items and you know, they were looking for their paint and their best pair of moccasins and best leggings, their best clothes that were all decorated. And they were just getting all excited and they were bugging their mom and their sister. I, I need my hair combed. I need my hair combed. Where's the bear grease, you know? They, you know, to slick their head, hair down, you know, to make it just shit slick and shiny, you know? 
boy, I've been watching her year after year. She's been getting beautiful and more beautiful. I said, man, when she marries me, I'm going to, she said, everybody's going to be envious of me. Everybody's going to be envious of me, she said. And they were just, yeah, I said, yeah, if you're, uh, you don't have that much luck, as brother said, just choose me. So they just, uh, they kind of uh, went off at each other and they're kind of uh, challenging with each other. And pretty soon they have their best clothes on, you know, their moccasins, their dress, their mother, her sister had put a lot of, uh, made their hair just look nice and his brother there his hair was all braided up you know he said no i don't want two braids he said just make one braid i said i want i want her to notice my full face the structure of my manly face how i hold my face and when i smile and that's what she's going to notice the other guy says, no, not me. He said, I'm going to put my paint on. He said, I'm going to look fierce. She said, she's going to, she's going to look at me. She's going to know that I'm the guy. And they were just carrying on. And so after they were all getting, got ready and stuff, and they were checking. Me, yeah, dude, you look fierce. Yeah, you too, bro. You look awesome. If I was a woman, I'd date you too. And they were just going on and going on and saying, Saying all kinds of crazy stuff like that. <laughs> so they came out of the lodge and they just stood there and they looked and holy crap. There was a big long line of suitors. Went to the, around the lodges and circled around here. It was like Black Friday at Walmart. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, oh, well. They got in line and they waited and all these other guys are checking out this little guy. Hey, some pretty tall, hunky looking dudes. Maybe I should put some bread grease on my shoulders, brought my arms out better. They look shiny, more muscular. I said, dude, why didn't you just not even wear a shirt? Could you could have greased you up a little bit. Really made you look shiny, you know. Really? He said, maybe I'll try that. There the line was moving up and stuff. Here they noticed that one by one, these guys, they would come by like that once in a while, kick the dirt, you know. Good for them, he said. She's waiting for us. She's waiting for us. So they were just... It's going to happen. We just got to be patient. It's going to happen. So, uh, sure enough, one by one, her parents were sitting there and all her friends were sitting there. And, and here, uh, she'd look at them and they, you could hear they were talking away and pretty soon she just, you know, she her head like this kind of stick up her nose a little bit, you know. Not interested. Not interested. Go like that, you know. I know. These guys, you know, they came, some of them came a long ways, you know. They had brought all these gifts, and before long, there was a big pile of gifts. Well, once they gave these gifts, you know, they couldn't pick them back up, even though they were turned away. So, um, Little by little, they moved up, and here they heard these guys talking. No, no, going, going, no, not in rest, no, no, no. Pretty soon, they were about three behind them. Come on, get your spiel ready. You know what to say? Yeah, I know what I'm going to say. He said, I'm going to, I know what to say. I've been watching, he said, listening, he said. Hey, these guys don't have it. He was uh, I know her. She's, I know what she likes. She likes me. No, bro. It's going to be me. No. All of a sudden, the last one he walked away fast, put his head down. He was mad, kicking the dirt. You know. There, 
stood up that one the one there I painted his face <clears throat> stretch out his chest around moving around <clears throat> muscles <clears throat> Like that, like that. Yeah. You know me, he said. He said, we were raised together, he said. We were meant to get for each other, he said. The girl just kind of looked at him, you know, batted her eyes, lifted her eyebrows. She said, yeah, I've been waiting for you, he said. Or I should say, you've been waiting for me to get up here. I'm damn fine, he said. I'm darn damn fine, he said. I'm damn fine, Mac. He said, you "No, know, these your friends, they all they all want to be with me, but I'm just interested in you." He said, "I'm a good hunter too, I'm a good provider." He said, "We don't have to worry about." And you know what? You can still hang around with your friends. He said, "I'll still hang around with your friends." He said, "How about it?" He said, "He said." You ready to get in my canoe? He said, sail down the river, float down the river. Love and life. And she looked at him and no. Nope. <laughs> she did. Huh? Nope. She said, I'm not interested. He just turned her head. Huh? Are you sure? He said, You want to think about it? <laughs> and uh Dang, he was really put off. He was mad, you know. Put his head down. Oh, he said. He walked away. Here, his friend came up. He said, I don't pay attention to him, he said. He's all about himself, he said. Me, he said, my whole life I'll devote to you, he said. If you won't have to do any work. I'll make all the fires. I'll gather all the wood, he said. You won't have to skin any deer. Or Take the fur off the rabbits. He said, I'll cook. He said, don't make your bed. He said, I'll sweep the floor. He said, he said, I'll take you for walks. He said, he said, every morning we'll get in my canoe and we'll just float down the river. He said, not a worry in the world. He said, he, your girlfriends will envy you, will envy you. She said, how about it? Sweetheart, she said, she just kind of rolled her eyes. Oh, is that the guy you're going for? <laughs> <laughs> you have to, no, he's the one. Hey, <laughs> okay, so her too, she rejected him and he couldn't believe it. So he caught up to his friend and he says, You too? Yeah, he said. Oh, he said. And so they went back to his lodge and they were sitting there and one by one until all the guys had been rejected. She'd rejected all of them. All of them. By the end of the day, they had all these goods and stuff. And here, the parents and her and her girlfriends called them inside their parents' lodge like that. And they were laughing. You could hear them laugh. What do you think about that? He said to his brother, I don't know. He said, something's wrong with her. He said, yeah. He said, something's really wrong with her. He said, I've seen some nice looking guys. I've known. He said, they've made names for themselves. He said, he said, they come from good clans, good families. He said, even us. He said, even us. My gosh. Uh, so the two bros, they kind of, uh, they went their separate ways and he kind of didn't feel good that evening. He didn't want to eat supper and his mom and his sister. Come on, you can get over. There's plenty of nice girls in the village. So the old man, the old young man, he went to his bed and he pulled his bear rope over him. I just want to sleep and he covered his head and rolled over him. Oh gosh, next morning, he didn't want to get out of bed. Feeling sorry for himself. He thought for sure, he thought for sure that he would be chosen. And he was rejected, he said. Especially in front of all his friends, he said. 
I don't want to go nowhere today. Come on, she said. The chief announced that we have to move to our winter cap now. He said, the snows are going to be coming. Harry looked up. He said, already the people were taking the, the puck away, the wrappings around the, their lodges, off, rolling them up, tying them up. People had bundles and they were packing their stuff and they were moving going through the forest and come on she said you got to get your stuff let's get going his mother said no i'm just gonna lay here for a while I said i'll be along and so uh they laid there no time at all it was just quiet quiet in the village they just laid there he said, man he said i wish i could teach her a lesson do something, he said. Shouldn't be people like that around, breaking people's hearts. He was thinking like that, looking out through the frame of the lodge there. He's thinking. And, and here the last of the people had left the village. And, you know, in those days, the garbage dumps were different, you know. People would show their tattered, old moxins just here and there and you know whatever was just laying all over here and there stuff they discarded they didn't want you know and so he was laying there just looking around didn't feel like moving you know he was going to have a bad day all of a sudden he heard uh, this uh i don't know if you ever been in the uh, woods like that and you heard a wind coming you could hear something far away coming through the trees something was coming through the trees and here he was he noticed that and that sound and all of a sudden you hear this uh, big whirlwind come through the trees like that Big whirlwind. All of a sudden, he was watching that. He was throwing up all this dirt and dust and whatever, you know. It was rolling around the camp, and he was watching it, and it was just picking up all this refuge and all this garbage and stuff. Can you see that on there? No? Huh? I don't know. Why don't you pull people on the scroll? Huh? <laughs> there's a there's a whirlwind in there somewhere yeah boy this whirlwind just picking up all this old waste and old clothing articles that people have left and it was just swirling around and, and then i come over by his place and he was just kind of sitting up and he grabbed that which barely been wrapped it around his watching it he was watching, all of a sudden, the, it just stopped right there, just stopped right outside the lodge. And some of these stuff just fell down the ground. But in its place was this tall, handsome, wonderfully built young man, perfect in every way, physically. Man, this guy was looking at this. A man was looking at us, thinking, "Where in the world did you come from?" And he kind of dropped his bare robe, and there he come out of the, the skeleton of his lodge, and he kind of was looking at him, walking around. Where'd you come from? He said. There he had these beautiful moccasins on, and. His leggings were just beautiful. The beadwork and quill work were just pristine, just beautiful, just like somebody in the shirt. In the shirt. He had some little bit of paint, and his hair was just black, 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 straight. Had some nice fancy feathers. Muscular, he was tall and long and lean and muscular. And said, wow, he said. What village are you from? He said, what clan are you from? <laughs> he said, you should have been here yesterday. 
<laughs> he was telling this. I said, I'm mean, just person wouldn't uh, answer him. Well, he said, so what's the deal with you? He said, big brother, he said. He said, uh, why are you so quiet? He said, you're not like the, the other Anishinaabs, he said. Girl, uh, quiet, he said. Hey, he said, look at that piece of dirty clothes. You know, get over there. He said, go over there and throw that away. And heard that guy, he did it. He obeyed him. We walked over there. He rolled it up. Draw it like that. Pick up that stick, he said. Throw that. There, that big man, he, he obeyed him. We was looking at him and he said, ah, I, said I got an idea, he thought. He said, he said, you want to be my friend, my brother? He said, <laughs> you're this big man. He looked at him. He said, didn't say nothing, but just kind of looked at him in the eyes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Just Harry picked up his bear rope, threw it over, kind of wrapped it up, and threw it over. So come on, he said, come with me. There they started off following the tracks. Of his people going through the forest. There by uh, later on in the afternoon, they got to a new village site. Harry, on the other end of the village, people were putting their lodges together. The camp was really busy. And here, uh, he looked around for his uh, his family's lodge. Oh, it's over there. All right. Come on, he said, let's go. He said, I followed them. And as they cut across the opening of the village like that, people noticed this guy, you know. Like, who in the world is this guy, you know? Man, he's never seen the likes of him, he said. He said, man, he said. Just, uh, everybody noticed him, you know. Also, the word got out. This girl, this young lady. Here they went to his lodge like that. Here they went in. He ducked in and here that big tall guy, he sat by the door there. And his mother said, Who's your friend? Yeah, I don't know. He didn't say his name. And she said, He just showed up. He said, After you guys left. He said, He doesn't speak much. He said, Doesn't speak much. About that time here, this young lady, one of the young ladies of the village, he said, <laughs> he said, your visitor is invited to so-and-so's lodge for supper. Make sure he comes there. And that's what he was waiting for. He was thinking, all right. So, well, she, he said, we're going to go over to so-and-so's place. We're going to have supper there. Being my friends invited, I'm going to go with them. So she brought, sat in front of him some nebish, some tea, and they were drinking it. He didn't say much. He just put his head down, drank his tea. You know, pretty quiet. Didn't say anything. You know, your friends got good manners. <laughs> so when the time came up, they went out, walked across the village, and sure enough, there was that one pretty young lady standing there with all her friends. Here they cut across the village to where her parents' lodge were. No time at all, she ducked in. And all those girls, they left. So... Young man, he went in first, and then this this guy went in. Ah, it's good to see you again, the father said. It's good to see you again. I hope you don't have no bad feelings towards my daughter for not using you. She's just really particular, she said. She said, well, 
I mean, his mother said, her mother said, but a woman's got to be today. She said, she's got to be particular today. You know, you know how moms are. Not going to let their daughters go with any guy that looks at them. So, uh, so all this time there was the daughter sitting behind them on the far side of the lodge like that. She was just looking like that. You could see her dipping her hands. She was rubbing this berry juice on her cheeks. Pretty soon both cheeks were all rosy, you know. Next thing she looked up and here her lips were all red, rosy red. Here the father said, well, who's your friend? Well, he said, I just met him. He said, this morning, he said, uh, let's see, uh, he told me his name. And here he thought about his, how he met this man and all the things. Oh, his name is, I believe, Mo Wiss. Mo Wiss, he said, boy, that's an unusual name. He said, he said, man of Mo Wiss, doesn't that means man of dirt and rags. Hmm. That's an unusual name for somebody like him. He says, he looks like he comes from a very well-to-do family and stuff. And, and here they were talking about clans. Well, what clan is he from? Because uh, well, so we're Martin clan. And what clan is he from? Oh, I don't know. He might be a uh, wild goose. He said, fox from the fox. Oh, okay. He said, so you can't marry within your own clan. So that had to be settled right away. And so they visited and stuff. This visitation went on pretty soon. The mother had put dishes out in front of everybody and they ate. And, and uh, afterwards, uh, they got up to leave. And here, uh, as they were leaving, going out through the door like that, they're going back to his place, and here, uh, pretty soon, that young woman come over to this young man to bring him back tomorrow. Bring him back tomorrow, she said. And here she turned around. Like, well, next day, they came back. And here, the parents were standing outside the door. My daughter wants to marry your friend. Really? His friend said. This young man said, really? He wants to move? Yes. He said, we think he's a fine man. He said, he's everything my daughter is looking for. I think she'll be happy with him. And he said, so uh, we're, in a few days, we're going to have a wedding. They're going to be married. And, and the mother says, and then hopefully we'll have some grandchildren, you know. So sure enough, next few days there, they were getting this man ready and getting him ready. And they got, uh, they had a ceremony. But his family didn't show up. They were waiting for him. They got married. And here, uh, my gosh, uh, the parents had made a little lodge there right alongside of there, kind of towards the back. And so he, uh, this young man, he told his uh, friend, Moise, he says, well, he said, he said, well, good luck, he said. Good luck, he said. And so he went back. My gosh, the next day, mother was had breakfast ready, and she tapped on the wall of their wigwam. And there's something out here to eat, if you want to eat. And so in a little while, they came out, and they started eating. And their mother asked, uh, how was it last night? <laughs> Is he a romantic fellow? She just looked at him. Mother, he didn't even touch me, she said. He just kind of rolled over. And I think he slept, he said. He didn't even say nothing to me. Really? He said, hmm. Maybe just, this is all new to him. I think so, she said. So 
this went on for a while. Went on for a while. And, you know, he would, uh, they'd take walks and she'd try to hold his hand and he just kind of pull his hand away, you know. And uh, this went on. And once in a while, his this young man would come over and visit him. And they'd uh, be talking and stuff. And, and here uh, his mother says, are things getting better between you? No, mother, he's so strange. He said, he never talks, never says a word. I'll talk to him and talk to him. And you just look at me. And I don't know if he's smiling at me or just something. His face never changes. They said, I know he's going to grow to love me. Well, after this young man had visited him one day, the next morning, it was just barely light. Snow was on the ground. You know, this Moas, he got up and boy, he was gathering his bow and arrows like that, and putting them over his shoulder. And, and here he was putting more wrappings around his legs. And so and she said, Where are you going? Where are you going? And pretty soon he just took off. We watched him for a little bit, and pretty soon she started rolling up their bed, like that, tying it up, had a big bundle, grabbed some pots, and pretty soon, boy, she had a little load going on, packing this little load. And uh, near Morris was cutting through the forest. Wait, husband, wait. You can't leave without me. You can't leave me, she said. You're sp are you supposed to be with you? No, he didn't even turn around. Here she was running down the trail like that, trying to catch up to her, to him. Or she started to sweat. She had never sweat ever in her life. <laughs> Pretty soon the trail started to narrow. The overgrowth of the trees, the boughs, the thicket started reaching out into the length of the Hair she her nice oil hair. Her nice dress got caught in the branch and hair pulled on. Oh, and she said. And one of the branches reached kind of scratch her her cheek. And she kept on going on the hair as she round got to the top of this hill. Here she seen Mois across this little valley, valley coming out to the top, the other top of this hill coming up. And she started running down this hill and here she slipped. And everything just went all over the place. And, Moes, Moes, help me, don't leave me, she said. I need you, I need you. She said, don't leave. And here she was packing up, grabbing her stuff as much as she can, putting it on her back again. And, running and puffing, 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 going up the next hill. About this time, it was getting on towards noon and the sun was coming out and she was just sweating profusely. And here she looked around and here she seen uh, that Moes way over there. So she went cutting that way, best she could through the trees and stuff. And, and here, as she, when she got to that spot, and here she come across uh, this moxin, this one moxin on the path. And here she picked it up. And, ah, this looks like my husband's, but it can't be, she said. And she, it's just a big hole in it. And she said, and it's ripped up. And you know, she threw it aside, she took off running. And she come out of that little area and she seen him going over there. And so she continued to run after him. She, wait for me, wait for me. I love you. She said, I need you. I need to be with you. And, and here she got to that spot and here she found another uh, moxin and piece of a legging. They were all just, legging was all torn and it was all, the quill work was all in disarray, ripped and stuff. Who's leaving this trash out here? 
And so she kept on going and she followed his footprints as best as she could. Pretty soon she come to the top of this hill. And here there was this pile of dirty old snow. Some of the waste of the garments were there and she was looking at them. She, what is this, she said. What is this? And here she looked around and she couldn't see her husband. She couldn't see her husband. And she hollered out, she says, Maurice, where are you? Maurice, where are you? I'm lost. I'm lost, she said. Come and get me, she said. Come and get me, she said. Don't leave me. I'm lost. I'm lost. And I said, thereafter, once in a while, when hunters would go through that area, they would see this woman. Her hair was just snaggled up and all uncapped and her clothes were all ripped and she was full of uh, cuts and bruises and scrapes and she was going around hollering, Mo Wiss, Mo Wiss, where are you? Mo Wiss, I'm lost, I'm lost. So, uh, a lot of times when you're so in love with yourself and uh, the only thing you see is an image of something beautiful and you're, you're pursuing a man that in your mind or another person that is imaginary, it's made up of dirt and rags, you have become truly lost in your life. And sometimes there's no return. <laughs> the end. <laughs> huh? Or vice versa. Or vice versa. Could be a man. Yeah. Yeah. So... Yeah. So his friend got back. His friend got somewhat of a revenge back, but he did it in such a way that he wished ill upon her, but then maybe it was duly noted that she might have to have that lesson, but she became lost because she became crazy like that. Didn't see the error of her ways. Nobody would have nothing to do with her. Her parents never seen her again. And she continued to be out there like that. Oh. Yeah. Any questions? Do you have any questions? Huh? Yeah. <laughs> How much time do we have? <laughs> Only half, halfway through. Okay. Oh, oh, oh. Do you ever met a person like that who's totally into themselves? Everybody's kind of known that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Narcissistic type. Yeah. 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 They don't see any faults in themselves or how they treat other people. So they're always justified in their actions and their thinking. So. Trying to find a perfect person. Right. Yeah. Well, they think it's themselves. They think it's themselves. So, but they're no match for anybody else. So, yeah. Um. Yeah. That's a good story, especially with, uh, well, when you think about raising your kids, mm -hmm. you know, like the kids that uh, might go through in junior high and high school and the peer pressure. Mm -hmm. First time, you know, you kind of look at the 
Yeah. And then insecurity is just, yeah, like, yeah. yeah. The story to tell as far as the values, all those type of things. Yeah. This stuff was selfish, all these men, the young men that came to cover her, and gave her attention and the gifts they brought her, and how she just basically did not show enough respect or even thanking them. No, no, I didn't thank them, no. She said, no. Just brush them away, you know, just turn her head and... Those guys, though, too, they're all talking about, you're the prettiest girl, we're waiting for you. They don't even say the same way her, you know what I mean? They weren't even thinking about any other girls, just because she was pretty. Yeah. Yeah, even those two young men, they were, they thought, you know, they were somewhat uh, into themselves a lot. <laughs> yeah. That's better. Like when the people are narcissistic in a way, and they don't look at the inner beauty of people or, you know, the backstories of people, mm -hmm. and then you they didn't cause clicks. Right. And then you get those certain clicks to where you get groups of people that will treat other groups of people less than rather than fairness and quality. Well, that's something you see in bigger populations, maybe not smaller populations, groups of people that kind of have to think about. I think a lot about uh, like the Hollywood stars, not all of them. I think some of them were genuine people, but the other ones, uh, they really don't know a lot about themselves because their whole life is, their career is about portraying an image or, or a person or a, a role. They have to- Brand. Yeah, a brand. Yeah. So. Well, I have another story, if you want to hear it. It's called Shim, about the a little wolf boy. You, he fell asleep. <laughs> Just go like that. Just press her on the nose. Go poop, poop. Mm -hmm. So in this story, it's called Shem, and Shem is a hard word to interpret. It, it, it means betrayal, but at the same time, it has to do with uh, 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 manipulation. All of those kind of things uh, it has to do with selfishness too it could be used in describing selfishness and stuff. There were families long time ago, but even today, you see uh people living great distances away from other population centers. Sometimes you think of these ranchers or farmers and, you know, they live quite a ways out in the country and uh, you have to wonder the sacrifices his family makes for that kind of life. You know, the kids growing up, having no friends unless the ones they invite and stuff, you know, over and just all out of that. Well, long time ago, there was, there was people that didn't live within the village because there was all, always some kind of draw, drama going on. And even today, you know, at housing projects on the reservation, there's a lot of, uh, mm, people were a lot better years ago than they are today. Um, they had values and they lived, uh, they lived a more quieter, complacent life. 
Now this one hunter and his wife, they lived quite a ways away from the rest of the people. They had a daughter and they had a little son, a little boy. Now the father, his only occupation was that he would hunt and trap all the time. And he was really good at what he did. And so, I mean, they had the best of that world, so to speak. They had plenty of bedding. Their shelter was made really nice. Uh, they lived really good. And uh, they had no really wants. And the mother and the children were always there. And she had her children, her, her daughter, who was older. And they had a little boy. And the father would really dote over the boy and just spent as much time as he could when he was home and you know and of course the little boy wanted to be like the father and stuff and and all the girls talked about was you know what was it like mother when you were growing up you must have had friends you know what was it like to have those friends she said and what did you guys do you know and mother said well we did everything together you know you know, we often met in the morning to go down to the spring, to the river to get water. And then from time to time, we'd sit together and we'd sow or we'd go pick berries or we'd just visit. And we there was a group of us that hung out together and we just enjoyed each other's company. And uh, she says, oh, I wish I had that kind of life. Why don't we ever go back to the village? And... Uh, for some reason or another, the father was against it. And then the story doesn't tell about exactly why he didn't want to go move his family back. Excuse me. So uh, they stayed out there. Well, one day it got dark and it started getting late and uh, the father didn't come home. And so that was one of the risk of bringing your family out into the wilderness that if you were the sole uh, earner provider in that family you know if, if something happened to you then you you know your family a lot of times wouldn't know what became of you and that was the case for this man so the next day the mother went out searching for him, searching for him, and she come back, and she had went in this big circle, and uh, but couldn't find him. So what they did, she told them the, the, the following day to build four fires along the perimeter of their camp and keep those fires going, and that the following day she would go, and when it got dark, she, she would see one of those fires. Well, they didn't want her to go, but the do they had plenty of provisions and food and uh, everything else. And the mother went looking, and uh, her day and a half passed, and no mother. Mother didn't come back. So here, uh, the daughter was really uh, worried. And uh, she didn't know what to do. She wasn't prepared for that, being without her mother. And uh, the boy, of course, he cried for his dad and cried for his mother. And the daughter, his sister, did what she could to comfort him. And, of course, she cooked and sang to him. And, and during the day, they would collect firewood and stuff. But... As time went by, the food got less and less. And, but there was always plenty of firewood and stuff. So she would sat, sit there by the fire at night and she would think about her mother's stories of where they had come. And she was trying to trace that all back in her mind, you know, and where they had come from. They had never visited the village, but she kind of got an idea which direction to go, if she had to go look for her people. So 
But she was worried about her brother if he could make that trip. And so she thought about it and she looked at her brother and she thought, you know, I can make it and I can come back and get him. He'll be okay. You know, and she then the next day she said, no, I better not take him. I can't just leave him here. And so anyway, she finally decided she could make that trip. She had to cross two rivers to get to this village was. And so she figured she could make it in two days and two days back. The boy would be okay. So she left the little boy one day morning and he didn't want her to go. He cried and cried and cried. And, but she said, I'll be right back. I'll be right back. Well, she left and the boy cried cried and pretty soon he couldn't cry no more and picked himself up went back in there and he threw some wood on the fire and fire started and she had made food and stuff enough for a, a week so there was plenty of meat and different things she showed him how to fill the kettle full of water and push it over there and throw dry corn in there and, and uh, some dry meat, make a soup, a wabu. And... So when he got hungry, he started doing that. Well, one night he was sitting there and he was kind of sobbing and crying, this boy, and here he heard uh, footsteps around their lodge outside. He kind of got scared, you know, when he called to his sister's name, but his footprints stopped, and then he called his mother's name and her dad's name, and when here, uh, something was by the door, and Harry looked here, the, he seen this long nose go underneath the door flap, and here, this long nose, it kind of came in, and here it was a, a wolf, big wolf's head came in to the door and the boy he got up and he backed to the other side of the fire like that and he grabbed a robe and grabbed it picked up a stick that wolf he come in that big wolf came in and just laid down by the fire in front of the door and uh there he looked over and saw a piece of dry meat he picked it up and threw it across the fire at him hear that wolf didn't move. And he what that boy watched him all night until he fell asleep here in the morning. He woke up, remembered that wolf. <laughs> and uh there it was gone. So he uh, got up and he looked around and sure enough there was footprints outside in the snow. And this boy snowed on the ground. So all day he walked around picking up pieces of wood and stacking them inside the lodge there. And once in a while he'd call out his sister's name and he said four days. So he stuck a piece of wood down in front of his lodge. He said, day one. And so here that night, same thing happened after it got dark here, that wolf came into the door like that just laid there in front of the door this time the boy wasn't as scared and so he took another piece of dried meat threw it over there and he went to sleep next day he went out there and put another piece of wood in the ground day two <laughs> by the fourth day his sister still wasn't back and by this time that wolf was out on the perimeter they could see he could see him he would just sit there so in time he had a bunch of sticks pushed into the ground bunch of sticks he went over and he looked at those sticks and he just kicked them down he said, my sister's not coming back she had left me out here he was mad but he couldn't do nothing about it. 
that night when that wolf came in the door, he got up, he walked over to that wolf and Harry was his hand, he fed him a piece of dry meat. The wolf ate it and then he kind of laid down in the stomach area of that wolf and kind of pulled a, his robe over it. That wolf snuggled up to him, you know. And he turned to him and said, you're going to be my family from now on. You're going to be my family. Next morning, boy got up and he was, the wolf was still there. He went out and here there was about six or seven of them sitting outside the door, those wolves. And they took off running. And here that one wolf, he took off running with him, but then he stopped and he looked at that boy and he motioned and said for him to come. I got here that boy he went running, chasing that wolf. Here that boy continued to live with the wolf. Once in a while they would come back to his old camp, but by then it was getting tattered and spring. It was warming. And the boy no longer was wearing moccasins and he was no longer wearing really anything. All his clothing had become tattered and he was just kind of running naked pretty much out in the wolf. But at night, the wolves would go come around them and they'd keep them warm. Like uh, one day, sometime later, here the wolves came to a, a, a river and uh, the rest of them just kind of sat down in the brushes like that. And that main wolf that was his friend, he he come nudge that boy and here that boy followed him what they were kind of sitting down in the bushes there looking across the river and here they seen some women coming some laughter and here who comes down the embankment here he sees his sister coming down the embankment to get water with uh the rest of his uh, the women. And he recognized her. And the wolf looks at him and he nudges to the boy, like to go to her. And the boy remembers, you know, what she had said. She was supposed to come back. And here, after they got the water and they went up the hill, the boy, he went walking across the water, following the women. Hear that wolf was behind him and as they went through the people or through the village the people stopped and they were looking at this little boy naked just completely untaken care of long scraggly hair <laughs> dirty sun-baked uh, with this wolf behind him and he followed these girls and as these young women kind of went this way and that way into their lodges there this he followed his sister her hair he stopped and she went into this lodge and here she came back out and here she had a little baby in her arms that this man come out with her and here they were both kind of fondling over that baby and talking and laughing here she happened to look up and she seen this boy standing a little distant from her, this wolf. And she, you know, she was surprised. And go away, he, she said, go away. And he started to talk. It was hard for him to talk. He had been gone for some time and didn't, forgot the words, you know. So I'm your brother who left and your brother left. She looked at him. She's and she had that baby to their husband, to their father, and his father. And he went. She went walking over there, and she knelt down. Oh my God! She said, "I'm so sorry." She said. Here she went to grab him, but he kind of pulled back. I always meant to come back after you, but she said, "But." She said, I met somebody and 
I didn't want to be out there, she said, no more. Why didn't you come after me, he said. I didn't want to go back, he said. I just wanted to stay here. But you can stay with me, she said. You can live with me. And here the boy pushed her away. And uh, here uh, people had gathered by this time. They were kind of watching this go on. And uh, the boy took off running and the wolf with them. And they ran through the center of the village. And here uh, uh, those other wolves, they come up the embankment. They were standing there or standing there and here that boy and that other wolf went running and, and people started running after that boy come back come back come back and you hear they went running down the riverbank and the sister was in pursuit and she says come back i'm sorry you stay with me and hear that the the wolf stop and the little boy was in the middle of them and here uh he crouched down and all the wolves came around him like that. And they just started walking around him like that, howling. Hello, ow. Walking around and, and all of a sudden they all bolted off and here in its place, there was this little wolf boy. This little wolf. They had transformed him. And he just... He took off running, he stopped, he looked back at his sister, and then he just ran with them. So sometimes that's how we become related to other animals, because uh, we choose to go with them, or we're discarded by our own people for some reason, or things get in the way. And so uh, that's how we have relation amongst the other animals, you know, sometimes, so... It doesn't happen very often. It's really rare that uh, a family or a sibling will abandon one of their own in such harsh conditions like that. So, but I guess the woman was never uh, really, uh, she was looked down after that because they said that she could have told that she still had family there, a child, a brother. The men would have went and looked. <laughs> So, yeah, that's the story of Shem. Yeah. So, don't ever go out in the woods by yourself. The wolf people might, but might wish caught you, adopt you. Hey. <laughs> yeah. Huh? Huh? I would have picked the wolf scared. Or the mother. Well, there's so many things that could have happened when you're out there hunting and stuff. And even today, they say you shouldn't go hunting by yourself, really. There's some. Huh? Yeah, by yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you don't know what can happen. There's all kinds of things. Maybe he fell or broke his leg or twisted ankle and was too far away. Yeah, something can always happen. Yeah. But it's interesting to wonder why he isolated his family like that. Yeah. Sometimes people have arguments, differences with their family members. Maybe he was wronged. Uh, he wronged another, a, a clan member from somebody and different is outside his family. And maybe he was just asked to leave. Yeah, there could have been that. Or he did something he wasn't supposed to do, and yeah, sometimes there was banishment. In the story about uh, the rolling head, the repercussions of the father killing the mother, and 
and her lover that was uh he had to die he, her parents came or their families came to kill him eye for an eye kind of thing i don't know were you did you hear that story were you online yeah <laughs> Yeah. Um, so you're calling. Well, back in the old days, I think it was common for like uh, elders to, uh, when they when they start to feel like they may be a burden on the rest of the people or uh, the village, or would, would, would they uh, make a decision to just leave? Just leave. And, Wow. Yeah. Wilderness. Yeah. If they didn't have any, if they didn't have no more family, uh, they didn't have no more relation. But you know, they were always taken care of. There was always good people in the village that would make sure they they ate and were taken care of. But sometimes, uh, if they really felt sorry for themselves, they would just kind of wander off into the woods and lay down that's what happened now uh, that there's a story about how the sweat lodge came i'll tell that story sometime that's what happened to that old man is uh the people had become so bad fighting with each other so many arguments and that people started hurting each other and, and sickness came of course and this guy lost his whole family because of he just went walked out in the woods he wanted to die he was grieving but this people had turned against the teachings and this old man he was had a supernatural uh encounter with a creator being kind of a being as a gift, uh, they gifted him the sweat lodge, God's nest. That's how the sweat lodge came. And he brought it back and the people yeah. learned. But well, I'll tell you that story too. That's how we got the sweat lodge. That's the old chip story about how the sweat lodge came. Yeah. So 